Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. About 15 years ago, I designed an OTL amplifier for studio monitoring reasons. So, for example, the design intention of this amplifier was to take a low impedance, low level audio signal, give it a bit of amplification, and then furnish enough drive power to drive some studio monitor headphones. Studio monitor headphones have a very flat frequency response and therefore this amplifier had to be very flat as well and that's why I chose an OTL design. OTL stands for Output Transformerless. So there is no iron in the audio chain within this amplifier whatsoever. Consequently, no audio input transformers or audio output transformers. The only transformer in this design is the power transformer itself. Now you may be asking yourself, why did he do that? Transformers are expensive, they give you isolation, they do all of these things. Well, they're also a bandwidth limiting device. Transformers will limit your bandwidth. So will capacitive coupling to a degree as well. But I wanted this to operate in an extended range. And any of you that have been on my channel for a long time know how incredibly fussy I am. I want that extended range to be within 1 dB. And that's why I designed this amplifier like this. And it performs very well. So coming up to now, basically the last five, six years, however long I've been making videos, I've been here for a while now, I use this setup to master the audio for these videos. So for example, the audio output from my video editing computer is flat. All right, it's very flat. And I want to keep the drive level from my computer's audio output very low. That low level audio signal goes to the input of this OTL amplifier. The OTL amplifier uh, gives me just a little bit of audio gain. And then the output of the OTL amplifier goes to my studio monitor speakers, which are powered as well. So that allows me to keep all the gain levels very, very low. And by doing that, I can keep everything very, very flat. And it allows me to master my audio here very, very well. Now, I can get into, you know, coloring audio and enhancing it and, you know, using processing and all that stuff, but that's probably better held in another video. This video here is going to be about the design of a protection circuit for this OTL amplifier. So, basically what happens is, if I don't turn everything on in the correct order, I get a very big thud out of my... Uh, studio monitor speakers because they are powered and when I click the power switch on on my OTL amplifier if my studio monitors are on already what ends up happening is the capacitors in the OTL amplifier charge immediately because I turned the power on remember there's no audio transformer so quite a jolt gets sent to the input section of my studio monitors and I get this really overpowering thud and when I say overpowering, I'm not kidding. It's a big thud. So pretty much everything that those studio monitors can put out, it happens within that moment. So I have to be very, very careful. Now, this isn't my original set of studio monitors, and I've gotten pretty comfortable to turning things on in the correct order. This is my second set, and this hasn't happened with this second set, but every time I turn things on, it's at the back of my head. You know, one of these days, I'm going to accidentally, you know, turn the monitors on and then turn the OTL on by accident, or I'll have the... the uh, the OTL amplifier off and not realize that the monitors are on and, you know, click the switch by accident or something. And I'm going to, it'll, you know, blow me out of my chair. <laughs> so at any rate, it's pretty loud when it happens. So this will prevent that from happening. Now I'm going to share the circuit with you. I'll design the circuit and I'll share that with you here and we'll take a look at the design. I'll go through the whole thing and I'll talk a little bit more about flat frequency response and amplifiers and things like that. There's a lot of really good information in this video that will really benefit you. And oddly enough, the information that has to do with this OTL amplifier will help you better understand switch mode and linear power supplies as well, out of all things. So, lots of really good information in this video. Let's get started. 
Here's a closer look at the OTL amplifier. So as you can see, there's no audio output transformer, it's just a power transformer. So this power transformer was taken out of a Hewlett Packard VTVM. This is 15 years ago, remember. So uh, this was taken out of a HP VTVM. I had a whole slew of these old HP VTVMs and they had these wonderful shielded power transformers in them and they were all in some form of disrepair like people had pulled tubes out of them and the cases were dented and wrecked so I, I didn't feel too bad about removing the power transformer so so at any rate I got a bunch of power transformers and I built a few amplifiers of this design so three or four at any rate and they uh, they all work very good this amplifier has never been serviced since it was put together same tube same everything everything just works nothing has ever failed in it so nice design power transformer gets i would say very warm i wouldn't say hot but i would say very warm and that that would be for example being left on for 10 to 12 hours something like that so it's well up to temperature by that point so uh, yeah, no problems with that whatsoever. And of course, it's you know it's just not powering a whole bunch of tubes. Mind you, the current draw of these tubes is a little bit more than most. So and just a, a volume control. Now the original design. This was one of my very first ones. I think this was actually the first one. I experimented with. Uh, a, I believe it was a bass and a treble control, one or the other, or something. A bunch of controls on either side in here just to experiment and then play with it and see how absolutely flat I could get things. So if there was a signal source coming in that was supposed to be flat, I could try and trim it up with the controls on the face. So there's not a whole lot of room here. And then I found that uh, most of the signal sources that I was dealing with at the time were very flat, so I didn't need them. So I ended up removing them. Now this box here, the actual little box itself was from a, a local electronic supplier. They had a bunch of these things and, I, and maybe they can even still get them. They're very nice little little project boxes to put uh, amplifiers on and such. So I've, I've gone through a whole bunch of these and built, you know, all sorts of different projects on these boxes. A very nice little, little box. 6SN7s, only one half of the triode is used. The other half of the triode is just all tied to ground to th keep things quiet. And the 6AS7s, both the triodes in them are attached in parallel, and they're just in, really just in class A. So some really large resistors on the bottom of the chassis, uh, just a little power switch, a little power light here. So that's all. In fact, here I'll turn on the uh, supply over here, and you can see that light up. There it is. So yeah, just a little power switch with a, a lamp on it, and a Nice smooth volume control that worked out very well. I graded a whole bunch of potentiometers before I put them in there to see if they, you know, make sure that they match in resistance. It's a big problem when you have dual potentiometers, one for each channel. I'll just uh, turn off some of the lights here and you can see some of the glow of the tubes here. These tubes, they, they glow very, very nice in service. Let's see here, lots of light around. I don't think I can get the, the light off the tubes there. But um, at any rate, yeah, they're very nice looking tubes when they're when they're glowing and they're fantastic for audio service for class A OTL. You'll find a lot of manufacturers, a lot of companies use these because they're a relatively low impedance triode. This is a these are pass elements for for regulators. Right? These make excellent re pass elements for, you know, any type of control regulator. And I've built my fair share of them using these tubes and they work very very well. So there's just two triodes in each one and very big triodes designed to uh, control quite a bit of current in in a linear power supply of some sort for example like a 300 volt regulator or something like that these are commonly used in tektronix oscilloscopes like those two big oscilloscopes that you see in the uh, intro shot there they have the uh, industrial version of the 6as7 in them so yeah 6s and 7s uh, as i say all original nothing has been changed and um, it'll be interesting to do a sweep on this thing to see how well it's still performing. So, and that's it. And then on the back side, I'll just move this around. It does have a little bit of weight to it because of that transformer. Nothing special on the back. Fuse, line cord, inputs, and the jack for the uh, headphones. That was it. Nothing, nothing too special.
The build inside really isn't very spectacular at all either. It's uh, very built to do a purpose, and it works very well. This thing sits silent. And when I say silent, I mean silent. You can plug a pair of 600 ohm uh, monitor phones in there, put them on your ears, and you will hear nothing. It sits dead silent. Until, of course, you put a signal in it and turn the, um, the uh, volume up on the front there, the gain control on the front. Here's the underside of the amplifier. And you'll see that I have a bunch of shiny screws here and the rest of them are black. And the reason being is the paint is removed underneath each one of these screws. So when I tighten these down, it makes good contact to the rest of the frame. A lot of manufacturers fail to do that. And I actually showed a video early of an example of this. And those of you that watch this channel may even be able to bring it up. So it's a well-known amplifier manufacturer and they didn't even do that. At any rate, it's very important to have proper grounding of the bottom lid to the case or you get hum. It's just the way it is. So everything needs to be shielded in here. You can kind of see some of the components already. I see a 33K 2% resistor right there, right through the uh, grill here. And I see some ceramic resistors. And I remember that blue capacitor, <laughs> just all from looking through this bottom. Again, it's been like 15 years, right? So I haven't had this thing apart at all. So I figured, well, this needs that protection circuit. It's time to do it now before I, uh, you know, possibly damage my new studio monitors. And I definitely don't want to do that or newer studio monitors at any rate. So what I'll do is I'll start taking out all of these screws and I'll be right back. All the screws have been removed and let's take a look inside. That's what's inside. Not a whole lot. Very simple design. So these here are the resistors that run to the plates. So these two 1.2K resistors are attached in parallel on each vacuum tube. These get pretty warm, not incredibly warm, but they get pretty warm. And these are the capacitors that couple the signal to the output jack. These here are filters down here. There's two 10,000 microfarad capacitors down here that are doing the filtering for the filaments on the six SN7s. And this is the B plus filter right here. And there's a nice big choke here to make sure that DC is very clean. And again, you know, as I say, this thing is just silent. So that's really doing its job in there. And uh, a yeah, little blue coupling capacitors there. And the resistors underneath are the cathode resistors. These are the plate resistors. Really just a brute force class A triode design is what this thing is. All right, let's design a circuit. Let's take a look at some of my chicken scratches here with this. Uh, so so pardon the, uh, the Paul chicken scratches here. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'll use a 555 timer for this because it's just the easiest thing to use. I have the 7555 version, which is the CMOS version. So I'll, I'll use one of those. All right. So I'll draw the 555 timer nice and big so that we can see this. So we'll put the, uh, the two together. So this is eight. This is the positive and this is the reset line, which is pin four. All right. So I'm going to tie six and two together as well. So pin number six is the threshold and pin number two is the trigger. All right. Very common configuration here. Pin one is the ground and then pin three is out. And uh, this is so many designs in a 555 timer. This is drilled into my head. So very uh, easy IC to use, very few external components. And since I'm using the 7555, which is the seamless version, I don't need to couple pin five to ground through a cap. So that's one less component. That's very nice to do. So I don't want that extra component in there. So this is going to be running off the uh, heater line, the rectified heater line. So it's going to be 6.3 volts, maybe a little higher because it started out as 6.3 and it's rectified and all that kind of stuff. So between 6.3 and you know, 6.4 volts, all right, is going to be the positive for this. Pin one is the ground. Now, I built a lot of circuits with 555 timers, and I would have to say that in order to get about 30 seconds out of this, I'm going to put the cap on the top side here to positive, and I'm going to put the resistor 
on the bottom side here to ground. And what this will do is this is going to have this remain off. So when this uh, voltage gets applied here, so when I apply current, I should say, to pin four and eight here, all right, this is going to be low. Nothing's going to change. This will stay low, and that's very important. Then after about 30 seconds, this should go high. Now, in order for me to get about 30 seconds out of this, I think I'm going to use 4.7 UF. So, and I'll use a 4.7 meg. Hey, look at that. Isn't that nice? So that should be 4.7 and 4.7, and that should give me around 30 seconds. Okay. So 30 seconds, and this will go high. This will go up close to the rail. Now, I want to drive a relay with this. Okay, so I'll, I'll draw my, my relay coil over here. We'll say this is this side, and we'll draw the coil, and hey, how does that look? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'll use a NPN transistor to turn this on, right? Because if this goes high after 30 seconds, high means the voltage is going positive. So if the voltage goes positive, an NPN transistor will turn on. So what I'm going to do is use an NPN transistor here. So... So we'll say uh, 3904 or something like that. Uh, I have uh, lots of transistors, uh, like the 3904, 3906 combination. I have the uh, BC817, BC807 uh, combination. So I, I may use either or. So we'll just call it 3904 because that's a nice standard everyday, uh, you know, component that you can pretty much find in your backyard in the soil. So they're very common. Common as dirt. Okay, so... Now, since we have a relay here, we want to protect everything. So let's uh, let's put a little diode across here. Why are we putting a diode across the relay coil like this? And why do you find this across relay coils? Well, what happens is, is that when the relay lets off, so basically when this transistor turns off, you get an inductive kick out of this thing. So it creates a little high voltage spike. And by putting a, this diode across there, it saves damage from you know uh, happening to our surrounding components and things like that. So it's the same thing with an ignition coil in, in a car. So if you recall the old breaker point systems, if you're old like me and you require, <laughs> you remember old breaker point systems, uh, what happens is, is when the breaker point closes, nothing happens. You don't get a spark. It's when the breaker points open is when the spark happens. So when the breaker points open, what happens is, is the field on the coil collapses and it creates that high voltage uh, spark on the secondary winding. So the breaker points close. All right. The coil itself, you can look at it as it's charging. So what happens is now there's current across that coil. So there's a circuit. There's 12 volts going through the coil into ground. And then when the breaker points open, it releases that out the, to the spark plug on the secondary winding. So when it's opening, the field is collapsing. You get a, uh, a basically a high voltage spike. And that's what this does is it stops it from damaging surrounding components. That's why you find diodes across relays and things like that. Depending on the configuration and depending on the circuit, sometimes it doesn't need diode. But uh, I just I add them just as standard practice. That's all. I'm going to have a capacitor across this as well. So I'll have a capacitor across this to ground so right across the supply line so we'll make this 10 microfarad at any rate right across here now uh, this will be ceramic and uh, this will be tantalum now you're probably saying why are you using tantalum well if you put a ceramic capacitor in a timing application you're going to find out why because one moment it'll be 30 seconds the next moment it'll be 22 seconds uh, depending on the weather it'll be 35 seconds uh, ceramic capacitors of these values move around quite a bit so a nice stable value is to use a tantalum they are pretty temperature stable not incredibly temperature stable but enough for a, a timer like this when you get into faster times, you know, and uh, you get below, you know, say, uh, a microfarad, so you can start using NPO style or NP0 style capacitors. Uh, you want to start using those NP0 capacitors are very, very accurate. So, but this is a pretty high value. 4.7 microfarad is still pretty high. So, you know, you'd be using a tantalum up there and that should be fine. And again, between these two here, I should get around 30 seconds in this configuration. Oh, here's something that's really kind of uh, interesting if you are into designing with one of these things. So if you reverse these two, okay, so if I uh, say I want to put the resistor, this resistor up here, 
and this capacitor down on the bottom. This will be the opposite. As soon as you apply power, this will go high for about 30 seconds, and then after 30 seconds, it will go low. In this configuration, this remains low when you apply power, and after 30 seconds it goes high. And I definitely want it in this configuration because I don't want any movement in these relay contacts with in the first power-up. All right, so I'll draw some relay contacts here. I'll go one, two, three, and this will be the bottom, this will be the top, and this will be the center contact, okay? So this is the normally closed position, this is center, and this is the normally open position right here. So uh, we'll say that um, either one of these, it doesn't matter, will run to ground, okay? And then this would run off to that speaker output terminal and keep it grounded. Now you can see if I turn power on, I definitely don't want these to move. I wouldn't want this to go click down here and then make contact for 30 seconds and then go click and let off again, because as soon as you apply power with this configuration, this is going to go click, wait 30 seconds, and then let off. In this configuration, nothing moves for 30 seconds, and then it goes click, pulls down, and opens this connection. You can see if you had this reversed for that for the milliseconds that it's going to take for this relay to close, I would get that high voltage spike still at that terminal. So you can see why it's so incredibly important that nothing moves, right? So that's why I want it in this configuration. Now this other configuration is useful for other projects, right? So uh, just, just one very easy way of reversing its function if you want. And of course you can you know, put a transistor a little differently on the output here if you want it to also function differently as well. So that is basically the circuit right there. There's not a whole lot more to it. Uh, I have a lot of 5 volt relays. I have a lot of small ones. I have those NEC ones, surface mount ones. Maybe I'll use that. So I'll have to put a resistor in line with that to uh, the 6.3 volts. We'll say 6.3 volts and the coil consumption, uh, 20, maybe 30 million. Uh, we'll say 33. We'll say 33 ohms. Should safely drop that down to a, a little over 5 volts, maybe around 5 volts, okay? And Because this is going to be a 5 volt coil. All right, right here. And uh, to bring this into saturation, it's nothing accurate, really 10K should be fine. And that'll reduce the load here, right? So we have 10K and that should bring that in, pull this down, and we'll have hap happy relay application right here. Yeah, that's looking like it. So what do you think we should add some, maybe some LEDs? Maybe an LED, a red LED for off. So when you first turn the power on, nothing is happening. So the LED is red, so it's in protection mode. And then when the thing turns on, it goes green. So that shouldn't be too incredibly hard to add. So what I would want to do for, say, a red LED. Okay, so take another 10K resistor here. Try and keep all the values the same just for simplicity. So I'll run this down here and we'll say, we'll run this to a PNP transistor. How does that sound? So the emitter is going to run to positive here. And the collector of the PNP is going to run out. And then on angle, run out through a resistor, and we'll say through a red LED to ground. So this will be a current limiting resistor right here. This is going to run up to the 6.3 volt line. Okay, so 6.3 volt. That's running to the same point as this. And now, since this is a PNP transistor, okay, so this is NPN right here. So we'll go NPN. Okay, so when you're looking at a transistor, all right, if you look at it like this, all right, so this is NPN, okay? So I'll we'll draw another NPN transistor like this. This is NPN, okay? So we know the base is always the middle, right? The base is always the middle. So we know that it takes positive to turn on this transistor, so we need current. Transistors are current-driven devices, right? So we need a bit of current there to turn this thing on. And of course, we have a current path here through the arrow. That's why we need a current limiting resistor here, because if we apply too much current, we're going to damage the transistor or pull the output of the, the uh, 7555 right down to ground or close to it, right, through this transistor, right, because we have 0.6 of a volt through here, because it looks like two diodes inside here. Okay, so the whole idea here is in order to turn this on, we need positive on here. So after 30 seconds, this goes positive, right? So this goes up to the rail. We have positive on here. This turns on, right? So if it turns on, it's technically connecting this to this, okay? If it connects that to that, it's going to turn on the relay, right? Because this is acting as a switch. So now since this is PNP, what happens is when this is low, so when this is towards ground, 
what's going to happen here is it's going to turn this on. Okay, so so when this is low, this will be red. Okay, so this is in protection mode. So when I first turn on the power, this is low. So if it's low, since this is a PNP transistor, negative turns this on. Okay, so now this is low towards ground, so it's negative, so we get our red LED glowing. This will be a current limiting resistor here, 220, 330 ohms, something like that. So uh, we'll say, for argument's sake, 330 ohms. Okay. So this will indicate the off portion. Okay, so now I have a, a red LED indicating the off portion. Now we want this to switch over, right, when the relay gets powered up and indicate on, right? So why don't we add an NPN? So I'll draw another resistor here. So these will both be 10K, just to keep things nice and easy. I'll draw an NPN transistor over here. Uh, I'll draw the base on this side, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is I'll draw this up to here and this down to here like so. Use this kind of like a pass element. So this will go to 6.3 volts as well. So I'll jump this over here and this will connect to here and then this will just go up to the 6.3 volt supply. What I'll do is I'll have another resistor here with a green LED and this should go down. So this is an LED, right? LED and, and to make sure that this is on correctly in everything, I will add a resistor here to here. So I'll put 22K here. That looks like that should work. So 22K here, 10K there. Yeah, that should be fine. And depending on the current draw of this, it's going to be 220, 330 ohms, something like that. Let's say 220. Okay. And um, yeah, pardon my scribbles. As I said, this is going to be very chicken scribbly. So so what will happen here now is when this goes high, what's going to do is it's going to turn this transistor on and this is going to allow current to flow through and we're going to have a green LED light over here. So red for when you first turn the switch on and then once this clicks over and you know uh, basically lets off on the ground, this will go green saying that it's out of protection mode. And I think... That should be okay. Now, I don't think we're gonna get any type of noise or oscillation in this circuit. This resistor, in some cases, would use, he's only got 0.001 one here to stop any type of oscillation depending on the layout. So I'll probably just add that anyways. It may not need that. So I'll probably just add that anyways. So 0 0.001, 1000 picofarad would be fine at that point. I think that is about it. Yeah. It's looking like everything's going to flow properly in this. Positive side here of the tantalum. This is going to be ceramic, so it's a non-polar capacitor. Ceramic capacitors are absolutely fantastic for decoupling purposes and things like that. I think that is going to work just fine. So here we have it. So this is a PNP. So this would be like a 3906 or something like that. Again, I have the BC807, BC817 combination. I may use those as well. And again, this would be a 3904. And uh, same thing like that. So NPN, NPN, PNP. And um, I just need to figure out a red and a green LED. Hey, you know what? I have some really neat LEDs that look like an SOT23 transistor. Uh -huh. I bought these a while back and uh, kind of forgot about them. So an SOT23 transistor, surface mount transistor, looks like this, all right, the big version of it. And I have a red and a green LED inside one of these packages, but the package is clear. It looks like a clear transistor. And I let's call it kind of funny, but that's one of the reasons I just bought it, because they look like transistors, these uh, little LEDs. So maybe I now have a purpose to use some of them. So what I'll do is I think I will use one of those and they were a common cathode. So this would go to ground and one side was red and one side was green. I'd have to look that up on the data sheet and um, 
and uh, put that on the layout accordingly. Pardon me, I'm just looking at this here, making sure everything is correct. It looks out like everything is going to work. So this is going to be the schematic. So what I need to do now is put this onto a small circuit board. And again, I want to make this all surface mount just because it's going to keep the you know footprint of the, the design small. I'll use the largest surface mount stuff that I have really is like 1206, right? And then of course, uh, maybe some larger resistors for areas that may pull a little bit more current like that. So I'll try and keep it all 1206 and uh, go from there. Normally I default to, whenever I build anything like this, I default to 0402. So uh, for example, an 0402 resistor is about that big. That's about how big an 0402 resistor is. Whereas a 1206 resistor is maybe about like so. All right, so it's quite a bit larger. So I'll, I'll use this. I'll zoom in with the camera and I'll show you everything when it's all done. So I'll go lay this out. In fact, you know what I'll do? I'll go find these LEDs and I'll show you the similarity between these and an SOT23 package transistor. So these are clear, whereas transistors are normally dark, you know, in color, right? just an epoxy body. So these are really neat. So I'll go find those and I'll be right back and I'll show you what those look like. All right, so after some more digging, I found the LEDs. I also have a little transistor here for size comparison. So I'll just put that down here and I'll zoom in on this stuff here in just a moment. I'll grab one of these LEDs and I'll, I'll show you the similarities here. So I'll just uh, open this up and drop one of those out. Okay, here we go. I'll zoom on in. Okay, so Here's a standard transistor, like a BC807 or BC817. And I will grab, so down here, I will grab the LED. So I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully you can focus in on that. You can see the little transistor here. It's the same package, an SOT23 packaged LED. It's really kind of, kind of a cute little device, clear device right there. So good for indicating on circuit boards and things like that. So same footprint, same layout, except instead of a transistor, an LED. So kind of a neat little component. So I'll use one of these as the indicator. Gives me the perfect excuse to use one of these things. Here's an example of what I do when I create a file for something and the schematic for that OTL amplifier would be in the same type of file put away. So what I do is I design everything up and I put everything in a folder like this. Now when I'm designing circuit boards like this, what I'll do is I'll create the layout like I've already done. This is the actual sized layout. And I'll explain this in just a moment. So I print two of them off just because the reason I have this on here is so I can show you one and have one populated at the same time. Normally I wouldn't make two because I'm just making one for this right now, but I'll make two of them just to do this. Okay, so this is all ready to print. They haven't been built yet, so I'm going to print this here in just a moment. I use a toner transfer method and I'll get two circuit board made and I'll show you. So this is what I do. I just put it all in a file folder. So this is what I just scribbled on the bench with you. So that's the schematic. Okay, and this is the layout which has been drawn. So some time has been spent at the computer drawing this. And then this here is the component layout map. Okay, so this shows where everything goes. And all the values are pretty much identical to what I drew. The only reason I amended these two values is just because these are the closest resistors I have in 1206. So I don't have a 220, I have a 214, and I don't have a 330, but I have a 332. So, uh, you know, buying up surplus resistors and things like that, this is what you end up with. But everything else is exactly the way it is. 4.7 meg here, the tantalum's up at the top, 22K resistor on the base of the BC817. I did use the BC817 and 807. Reason being is I have some rolls of these things. So I have rolls of about 4,000 of each of these transistors, whereas my uh, 2N3904, 2N3906 supply is going down. So I'll just even it out, I'll use these instead. It'll be absolutely fine. Here's the 10K resistors. There's that little LED right here. This is going to be a relay, an NEC relay that I'm going to use. That'll fit right here, a little diode across that. So this will go to one speaker terminal. This will go to the other speaker terminal or output terminal, if you want to call that, to the headphones. It'll go from, you know, one here and one here. And this will mount to that spot that I showed you in the chassis. I'll show you that here in a moment again. So I'll use a, a 632 screw for that, I believe. 
I'll drill all these holes to 033. That should be absolutely fine. That'll fit most wires that I have. And this is just a spare ground. So this is going to be screwed to the chassis. So there'll be a nice ground there. But I never trust that. So if that ever comes open or gets corroded or who knows right over time, right? I want an actual solid soldered ground. So I'll run that to the ground at the uh, speaker jack there. So positive and negative in. And uh, yeah. It's pretty much ready to go. So I just have to take this now. And this is an ink. I printed this off with my inkjet printer. So I have a toner uh, laser printer. So I'll print this off. And of course, this will be mirrored. So the way this will print off, it'll look like, you know, if you could shine a light through the back of it, it will look like that on the top side of the paper. And then when I put the transfer onto the copper, it will, you know, when I flip the copper over, it'll look just like that. So this needs to be mirrored. This is just a fence around the outside here. So the reason I put a fence around the outside, this will etch in copper, and this will also be toner, right? Because this will, you know, the toner will be covering copper. Is what that does is it seals this in. So basically, it seals it when it's running through the laminator. Because I do the toner transfer method, I explained that in one previous video to this. So how I end up doing all this. So that just shields it all in and makes sure that everything just stays, you know, nice and solid in place. And uh, again, it just makes a fence to protect everything. It makes it a much more uh, solid transfer by doing that. Now, if you have a very hot laminator like I have, I have a very hot laminator. It's a custom thing that I've built myself, like most things I own, I've built myself. So um, it, uh, you know, the, the laminator is extremely hot, so I usually don't need a fence. But, you know, it's just good practice. And it's a little bit extra toner. Who cares, right? So I'll print these off and get these onto some copper. Again, if you're interested in seeing that process, uh, that's in the previous video. And uh, I'll get these built. This is very much like many of the projects that I release on Patreon. It's just like this. So all the files are up there on Patreon. You can these are direct print. These are already sized. So if your printer, you know, prints to scale, which most printers do if they're set on their default settings, uh, this prints out just the way you would see it. A again, this would be mirrored, right? You, uh, this here is not mirrored because I'm showing this to you, but the actual layout would be mirrored. You just print it off, everything's sized. So you could take the little IC, the 7555, drop it right onto it, and it's sized. All the resistors and parts, everything, you just make your own circuit boards that way. So that's how things are, are done on Patreon when I do the... Um, and I share all of these projects and there's a lot of these projects up there and I will most likely share this on Patreon as well. I'll ask some of the patrons now if you would like to uh, actually have a copy of this up there. I haven't put this up there yet because I'm just doing this right now, right? But um, anybody here that would uh, like to see that, I'll uh, definitely add this up there if you guys, you know, think that you have a need for a delay circuit. And uh, you could, you know, just change the values if it wanted to be faster or slower. Just down this value, you know, change that from 4.7 to uh, 4.7 meg to maybe 2.2 meg. And, you know, you'll change the timing you know, and make it either faster or slower by depending on which way you go, right? So uh, the relay is a common relay sold by DigiKey. All these parts are common and current. So everything is uh, very easy to do. So at any rate, what I'll do is I'll get this printed off now. And... I'll uh, get it all populated. So I'll have one unpopulated and one populated to show you here in the next shot. And just like magic, it'll take no time at all. And through the magic of the camera, in seconds, I have a bunch of circuit boards made. So in all reality, to make two of these boards took 15 minutes. That's all. And that's excluding drilling. The drilling would take an extra couple of minutes. So about 15 minutes for a single-sided board. And if I was to make five single-sided boards, it would still be 15 minutes because they would all just be on the, the same thing, right? So 15 minutes for both of those boards or five or 10 or whatever I want to make. At any rate, that's the little board right there. Pardon the dust and stuff on it. So that is the unpopulated version right there. And for size reference, I'll put this here. I should have done that for the last one. Here is the populated version, right there. Now, of course, populating the board takes a little bit of time as well. But uh, no big deal. So there's that little LED that I was excited to use there. So I figured it would go good between the, uh, you know, the relay and the 7555. There's a little tantalum up here, 4.7 microfarad tantalum. One thing to keep in mind about tantalum capacitors, and this applies to many tantalums, well, pretty much all of them, is the line end 
on a tantalum is positive. So it's kind of different than electrolytics and other capacitors, right? So of course they have to make things confusing, right? So something you always want to keep in mind, always check to make sure the line end is usually positive on tantalum capacitors. You don't want to hook tantalums up backwards because they get pretty grouchy if you do. So there's the uh, timing setup there. There's the uh, 4.7 meg and the 4.7 microfarad tantalum. And the switching transistors and everything else. So I'll get some wires attached to this thing and we'll time it and see how close I come in. All right, I have my crusty old lab timer here. Let's see how close this comes in to 30 seconds. So I have the power supply set to 6.4 volts. So I'm sure that the uh, supply in that amplifier is going to be very close to that. And all I have to do is turn the output of the power supply on. So what I want to do is hit the start of the timer and turn the output of the power supply on at the same time. So what I'm going to do is put my finger on the button here, put my finger on here, and I'll see if I can click them both at the same time. So here we go. So let's see how close this comes in. So keep my finger on this, ready to stop this. So we can see how horrible my reaction time is. I'm sure my reaction time at the racetrack at the tree is a lot better than this. I used to get very good 60 foot times. Right, here we go. Look at that. 30 seconds spot on. Now that's just with a random value tantalum capacitor and just a, you know, uh, and when I say random, I mean, un, you know, not graded. So when you pull them off the reel, they're all a little bit different than each other. And the same thing with the resistors. I didn't grade anything. And what does this indicate? This just indicates that I spend way too much time designing circuits with this, you know, with these uh, 7555s. This is all that indicates, I guess. At any rate, that's, um, was that fluky or not? I don't know at that point. So some of you more experienced builders may ask you, be asking this question now what if you quickly cycle this is it going to you know hold off for 30 seconds well probably not if it's very quickly cycled because there really is nothing there to drain that capacitor off but it is such a small value that it's going to be well into a safe zone so it's going to be well beyond 20 seconds it probably be 25 seconds or something like that so in order for vacuum tubes to you know heat up and stabilize it takes about 15 seconds or something like that and if this was to cycle on and off again say they you know had a very quick power outage there would be way enough time for this little timer to basically you know stabilize let the circuit stabilize again because if the power goes off and comes right back on the tubes are already warm right at that point so basically we're just holding off for the power supply and that would you know that's we're talking seconds would be absolutely fine for the power supply maybe you know even milliseconds if it's just a cycle that fast so if one was to use a larger value capacitor than this tantalum here and you wanted to make sure that it drained off very quickly you know a couple extra components could ensure that no problems again for this circuit i really wasn't worried about that and believe me i thought of that already when i was putting this together so what i'll do is i'll reset the timer here and i'll quickly cycle this and we'll see how close this comes into 30 seconds after it's cycled so it'll be a little bit lower i'm sure so i have to shut the power supply off and then turn it on as well as hit this at the same time so here we go okay we'll call that a very quick cycle maybe a second something like that three quarters of a second so we'll see how close this comes in. I would guess 25 seconds, something like that. 26 maybe, we'll see. So yeah, we could comfortably say 25 seconds. All right. So, and that was just a very quick cycle. So, you know, a faster cycle might bring that down to, you know, 23, but you know, it's still well within a safe zone. And again, you know, everything is warmed up in the amplifier at that point. It's basically just holding out for the power supply and that's pretty much immediate. So I have to get that inside the amplifier chassis now and get it wired up. So I'll get that all happening and I'll come back and show you how everything works. The little board is now installed. So what I did is I put a screw through the top side 
and put a nut and a star washer on the bottom, tighten that down to the chassis, put another star washer on the screw, put the circuit board down, and then put a washer, lock washer, and nut on this side. So it spaces it away from the, you know, the chassis just a little bit, so I can run the wires on the underside to keep it nice and clean. And the star washer that's on the back side of this bites into the rear side of the circuit board and holds it nice and stable on that screw, so everything worked out very well. So what I'll do is I will turn this on and we'll make some checks here. So I'll turn this on like so. So right now, this should be shorted. You can hear that, it is. And this too, on the other side. This one here. I'm doing this by looking in the monitor. If I was to look forward, I would stick my head in the camera. <laughs> So wait till this turns green, and then it should be open. Okay, so I might get a bit of a beep here for a second. Oh, that's pretty good. It's open. And... No problems. So I'll shut it off. And again, should be shorted. And shorted. So it's working well. So let's take a look at the frequency response. Let's check out the frequency response of this OTL amplifier using the Stanford Research SR780. So there's a signal coming out of the SR780 going into the amplifier, and then the SR780 is watching the output of the amplifier across a 600 ohm load, and that's what's going to give us our response on the screen here. We can check out the 1 dB, 2 dB, and 3 dB down points. So I'll just start this. Now this will take a few moments because it is quite a long sweep and it is only 300 points but it still takes a while because it is down at 5 Hertz. So the start is 5 Hertz and the end is 50 kilohertz and then what I'll do is I'll move the marker around and we can check the 1, 2 and 3 dB down points here in just a moment. So right now it's sweeping the amplifier. And what you're seeing on the screen is it's reading the output of the amplifier. And this is what's giving us this result here. And as you can see, it's 1 dB per division. That's why you can see such a steep slope right here. So as it gets further along, it'll speed up. It just takes longer at the lower frequencies. All right, so now we can check it out. So I'll move the marker around here. So we can see that this is one dB right here. So flat along this area here. And I'll just hit backspace to stop that. So you can see that right here, we're dealing with one dB, one dB down from its flat area. And the start is 17 Hertz. Okay, so this is within 1 dB from 17 hertz all the way to about 22.5, if you want to call it that. So that's pretty good, within 1 dB. So within 2 dB, we can see the top end is 33.5 kilohertz, and then of course 3 dB down, which is quite common for amplifiers to be rated at, is 44 kilohertz. So if we go over to the other side, so 2 dB down, it's at 11.8 hertz. That's only 2 dB down. And then you can see at 3 dB down, we're dealing with 9.2. So because I'm picky, I pay attention to this area right here, the 1 dB down area, and that's 17 hertz. all the way to almost 22.5. So that performs extremely well, and that's how I wanted this thing to perform. I wanted a very extended frequency range. 
When we're talking about the operating frequency of a power transformer, nowadays it's very common to hear 50 or 60 hertz, 50 or 60 cycles, depending on where you live in the world. And this is the standard core size for a smaller power transformer that runs at 50 or 60 cycles, all right? In fact, if it was 50, it'd probably be just a little bit bigger. Standard 60 cycle transformer. Well, way back in the day, we used to have 25 cycle electricity. Now, 25 cycle electricity requires a lot more core size in a transformer. This is a 25 cycle transformer. This is a 60 cycle transformer. Now, the same thing is true for audio transformers. If you want an audio transformer to perform down at 25 cycles, you need a lot more core size than if it was de designed to, you know, perform at 60 cycles. So you can see the difference just from 60 to 25. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, new switch mode power supplies have really small transformers in them and they make a lot of current. Well, why is that? Well, switch mode power supplies operate at much, much higher frequencies. So, for example, this is 25 cycles, this is 60 cycles. If we were to look at a standard switch mode power supply, many of them operate in the hundreds of kilohertz. So, hundreds of thousands of hertz. So, as the frequency gets higher, the core size gets smaller. And that's why we can get so much current out of such a small power supply nowadays. Now you're probably thinking, well, switch mode power supplies are the magic solution to everything, right? Well, no, they're not. Everything has its, I guess you could say it's good and it's bad points. Switch mode power supplies make a lot of noise and it is hard to get rid of that noise. So without a lot of extra filtering on the outside and some pretty good shielding, a linear power supply is a much, much easier thing to design and to work with. They sit silent because they've got a nice clean sine wave or you know, at least whatever's coming out of your wall going into the transformer. And you know, there's nothing that's really switching at a very high frequency and you don't have square waves basically, you know, oscillating a transformer at a very high frequency. Square waves are, you know, very harmonically rich and create lots of noise. So there are ups and downs to everything. Yes, they're small, they provide a lot of current, and they're efficient nowadays, but they are noisy. And, uh, you know, of course, there, uh, there are other things as well that I won't really get into in this video. But anyways, that's a representation of you know, core size and operating at lower frequencies. So whenever you're looking for a very nice audio amplifier that's supposed to have a very good frequency response, make sure that you pay attention to the audio output transformer core size because more is really important when you want to get way down or really low in the audio frequencies. If you're enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be more videos like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronic devices alike. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. If you want to be notified as soon as I post a new video, don't forget to tap that bell symbol. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way, and gaining access to many of my personal electronic inventions and designs and a whole bunch of just other random circuits, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the Show More tab, and I'll also pin the link right at the top of the comments section. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.